Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, session 85 of Libraries in Response. Uh, started four years ago. Interestingly, uh, in response to the health crisis of, of that year. when COVID landed on us. Uh, and today we're, we're still talking about health and another related, certainly related crisis is access to health information, health services that, that libraries are increasingly being asked to supply. Um, this is, uh, these are our speakers, uh, Becky, Michelle, and Karen will We'll get back to them in a moment, but they're leaders in this field and are offering uh, a quick seminar, basically, on uh, how how to do this and how they're doing it, certainly, and uh, where it goes. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, open collaboration of libraries doing innovative things with technology, and uh, since... 2007, when we initiated fiber to the library, calling for all 17,000 libraries facilities in the U.S. to be connected with uh, gigabit fiber as a smart public policy uh, step. Still working on that one, but we're getting pretty close. Uh, we are hosted and recorded by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions based in The Hague. At the helm is uh, Stephen Weiber, who's the head of public policy for IFLA, an outstanding organization and has been a longtime partner with GLN in public access. And we're happy to have them. Uh, sponsoring today is IMLS, who's come, come in with a support grant for, for the series. We also have support from... Uh, uh, state libraries in New Jersey and Texas, uh, and we thank them very much. So the image that you've seen on your invitation on the registration, uh, credit is due to Henry Stokes of the Texas State Library and this campaign they initiated uh, a few years ago. Uh, maybe these the illusion uh, of the image on that invitation was uh, unclear to many of you being so much younger than many of us who are children of the World War II generation, but this was a big time image to appeal to women to do the job, to get involved when we had a shortage of, of males during the war to do things like manufacturing. And so they picked up that you can do it, do IT, uh, motif for this campaign, which is, I recommend that to anyone. Thank you, Henry. Uh, these are some upcoming topics we're looking at for the year. State of the States, we've had state libraries come on and talk about the state of libraries in their in their particular states and how they're doing various things and, uh, and the outlook and the experience and so forth. It's, it's been really, uh, really rewarding. We've had uh, 15, six, no, 17 states uh, give these reports over the last a couple of years and, and look to do more of that. Libraries and AI, we just had one of those sessions last week to kick off the 2024 uh, series, uh, an excellent uh, session. I recommend to anybody. Uh, the recording is up on our uh, YouTube channel and also on the Libraries and Response page at giglibraries.net. Climate adaptation strategy is something we keep returning to because there's just no evading it. There's no, there's no alternative to adaptation, which when a crisis comes, you just have to deal with it. And, and climate is not going away. It's the crisis is building and it, it kind of supersedes all other crises of which there have been a cascade of crises since we started this in 2024. Uh, federal broadband programs are relevant, of course, to libraries because there, there's a, a load of funds that are flowing through uh, these channels. 
but you know they they're going to end it's somebody used the illusion of a uh, a python digesting uh antelope you know it's in the middle but then you know it's going to go through and we're going to be back to scraping for pennies but for the moment taking advantage of these programs is, is good good strategy broadband from space is one of our favorites uh because it's well it's rocket science and it's um pretty cool uh, leading practitioner notwithstanding, this allows broadband to be delivered anywhere on the planet. I mean, real broadband, high capacity, multi-hundred megabit connectivity to the most remote parts of the earth, including the poles, including far Congo, you know, anywhere, just just straight up. <clears throat> so that's that's a big change in traditional infrastructure, which is terrestrial based on building out from a core, uh, which is relevant to telehealth and perhaps lifelong learning. Any system, any infrastructure system, uh, the economics say the farther you are away from the core of that network, the more expensive it is to deliver services. Right? It just seems commonsensical. Uh, and the farther away you get from that core, which are typically in dense urban areas, the more spread out people are, and they tend to have less money. What that translates into in market economics is we don't do that because the there's no money in it. So we will continue to upgrade in the, the higher margin, lower cost areas, the central denser areas, and that's what we'll do. And providers, telecom, whatever, will only do that, uh, will only not do that if they are uh, coerced by, by government to intervene. But that's what we've done. That's been the concept of universal service for a long time. If if a service is considered essential and basic, then the saying goes, the principle is that everyone deserves affordable access to it. So that's electricity, that's a telephone, but not broadband. Broadband, the provider said, oh no, we're just like, we're just technology companies. We're like Cisco and Intel. We'll just invest where we can expect a return. And they've been able to do that because they're extremely effective at uh, writing a line of regulation to make more money than they would make from a million lines of code. And they have more lawyers than engineers, and it's they've got the best lawyers, as a matter of fact. So it's been a dilemma for a long time. We started this, as I mentioned, in response to the health crisis of 2020. And we were all freaking out. You know, what is this? What do we do about it? How dangerous is it? How contagious and so on? And everything was closed. It's it's hard to remember how intense that moment was. It's hard to remember a lot about those couple first couple of years. But if you try to think back, it it was really attention getting, and it happened everywhere. That was that was the other thing. It's just it was suddenly everywhere in the world, and civilization as a whole had to respond to this. We haven't ever seen anything like that, that fast. And of course, we're tied together. Uh, so we, because of transportation and telecommunications, so it was everywhere. And uh, civilization turned on a dime. And it was just really incredible. I mean, world wars don't happen that fast. But uh, uh, COVID did, and it got everybody's attention. It made the point about how connectivity is essential in such a situation. Libraries were closed. We asked the original question when we started this. Well, okay, well, what is a library if the building is closed? It's not nothing, but what is it? And of course, that led to a whole conversation about uh, you know turning Wi-Fi out the window and picking up books at the curb and all the things you know about. And it was it was an impressive response by libraries. But it was just the first crisis of 2020. It was within two months that. Uh, the U.S. went through uh, a, a social crisis after the Floyd murder, and it was a huge upset about that. And then there was an economic crisis related to the pandemic, and then there was a political crisis, and then there's always been the climate crisis, which gets our attention constantly and ever more so, as we'll continue to talk about that. So to the point today of uh, the availability of uh, medical care, health advice through the through the health system, and so uh, we use this in the in the uh, invitation registration page. 
that primary care is in decline because, well, it's just not as profitable. And when you figure, well, why are these are physicians? These are healers. They didn't get into the business for just to make money, did they? Well, they can just go to Wall Street if they, they want to do that. Uh, but they obviously started out with some notion of, of caring for people just for that. But also they were probably attracted by what used to be considered status and uh, a comfortable living. But to get to that comfortable living, you have to invest heavily. And so these are the basic costs that, uh, uh, that these uh, professionals are faced with to get to the point of starting out. And they don't make, make that much starting out, but they've got to pay it off. So like with law and other fields, and like the example on infrastructure, they will go where the money is because they have to have it. They might they might want to work in you know a small town uh, primary care, but they won't be able to pay off their their debt if they do that. Or uh, lawyers, same thing with lawyers. You know the the similar kind of uh, costs that just push them into certain markets that will allow them to simply you know survive. And and that is a big part of what's creating this divide. Uh, you know, you can find the best dentists in in the U.S. all gathered on Central Park South, <laughs> but if you're in you know, far Idaho, you may be challenged to find such a, such a capability. And and people in crisis, they go uh, they go to the library. I mean that. It doesn't matter whether it's a, uh, well, maybe it's a disaster, right? So somebody says, well, you need to go to FEMA for help. And they go, what's FEMA? So they go to the library and then uh, the librarians will help them log on, file a claim with FEMA. Like so many other public services, people access through a library, not just because they may not have connectivity to home, which many don't, but they may not be able to navigate these kinds of services online because they're all different and they're often very daunting and maybe they only have a phone and a lot of these apps are not built for the phone. So um, this is this is a phenomenon we're going to hear more about right now as we get into our topic today. Uh, Becky's going to lead us off. Becky's with uh, Cuyahoga County System, a leading large uh, library system. Uh, in Ohio, of course. And then we'll hear from Michelle and Karen, who are going to do a, a tag team presentation uh, on what's happening in New Jersey and uh, particularly in the East Brunswick uh, Library. So welcome, Becky, Michelle, and Karen. Uh, stop share, and I'm going to ask, uh, ask Becky to Take us out. Welcome back. Welcome back, Becky. It's good to see you again. Welcome back to Libraries in Response. Please tell us what's happening in Cuyahoga. Sure. Thanks for having me again, Don. And I did this last time, and then I couldn't. Um, I lost the how to share button here. Here we go. Let me make my show an actual slideshow. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Becky Ranella. I'm the Literacy and Learning Director at Cuyahoga County Public Library. Um, I'm going to start with a bit about uh, who we are and who I am, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in the health realm, telehealth included. Um, Cuyahoga County Public Library is one of the uh, busiest and best libraries in the country. We have 27 branches. Um, you can kind of tell from this slide, we are the suburban library system that rings the city of Cleveland. Um, we are fortunate to serve uh, many diverse areas of this county. Um, and uh, really, uh, we are a library rich area. There are actually nine library systems within Cuyahoga County, uh, us, the city of Cleveland, and a number of smaller systems. Here's a little bit better look at just our branches without the city in it. Um, but we are kind of all over the place. We uh, service what uh, we consider inner ring suburbs. So those suburbs that ring the city of Cleveland directly and then um, a number of uh, the other suburbs spread out throughout the county. Um, a little bit about me. I've been with this system for over 17 years now. 
Um, my background is actually in adult learning and digital equity. So you're going to hear me talk quite a bit about health, but also predominantly about digital equity today because the two go hand in hand at this period of time. Um, I've been with our programming division here at the library uh, since its inception in 2013, um, and I've been the director of this division for three years. Uh, we are a very busy library system. We do over a thousand programs a month, some set centrally scheduled uh, between the 24 staff in my division and then some um, scheduled by the branches with logistics and uh, curriculum assistance from my team, as well as outside programmers and a whole bunch of other things. If you think about it, we're probably programming on it. Um, when I came into the system 17 years ago, I brought training and digital equity with me. That'll come up here in a few minutes as I talk um, about a bit more um, involving health literacy and digital equity. Uh, so public libraries are well positioned within our communities to advance health and promote health services. Don talked about this initially in his intro. Um, our customers trust us and they come to us when they are scared and they don't know something um, when they're at a place where they just need some help. Uh, they trust us to give them the correct information and to lead them in the correct direction. Um, our story of uh, access and health, telehealth and community health has its roots in the pandemic, much like Don was talking about. Um, if you would talk to me prior to 2020, I would have said to you, people don't need access in their homes or need their own devices because they have their libraries and they come to their libraries when they don't have it. And that was true until we shut down overnight on March 13th and 2020. Um, and in previous uh, iterations of a presentation uh, in this exact forum, I've shared the fact that in two months, we logged 80,000 Wi-Fi sessions from our parking lots, our 27 yeah. parking lots. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a stat that breaks my heart still. I have a hard time talking about it because it proved to me exactly how wrong I was. Uh, that people didn't need access. Um, and I think it proved to a lot of libraries. Uh, I felt very unmoored at that point. So one of the things we did when we came back though, was really look at where community need was and um, how we could address that community need. And one of those ways was um, through addressing some of the health equity and some of the uh, challenges that we saw. So once we were back and we were open, we utilize some, some pandemic money to make all of our study rooms. Um, we have 20 of our 27 branches have study rooms and every study room in the system at this point is equipped. Um, it's equipped and it's specifically equipped to ensure that if someone wants to come in or needs to come in to do a telehealth visit, you know, also to do an interview or a meeting, um, you know, of, of any sort, they can come in. But one of the things that we paid particular attention to was, can they come in and do a telehealth visit? Do we have everything we need? Speakers, a computer, a microphone, webcam. Um, we've been gig connected for, I don't know, probably 12 years at this point. As soon as we could be, we were one of the first libraries that was. So we've got the high speed piece down. Um, and then we did some training. Once the rooms were connected, we did some training with our staff to ensure that they could also get customers connected um, and ensure that they could do kind of whatever they needed to make sure that our customers could uh, access whatever their information need was or their connectivity need. Um, I'm gonna say right here, that is the extent of what we've done specifically around telehealth. We made the areas available and we made our staff um, comfortable enough to work with customers. Um, it's not nearly the story that I have to tell here, but it was an easy lift just to put the equipment in and make sure that our staff knew how to use it and that our customers knew about it. Um, one of the things we also did though that I think was interesting that I do wanna mention here is that we established Zoom rooms. Um, and these are Zoom licenses that anybody can use to connect, um, you know, and that can be to connect to their doctor, connect to their relatives, um, they can check out a license and use it and reserve a room to use it or use it from their own um, their own home. Um, we felt like that was an option 
uh, for anybody who needed that kind of access or needed additional access, that was something that we could provide. Now, I make this sound easy. Um, trust me, this involved many, many months of fighting with our IT department around what, how to connect people, where to connect people, what kind of equipment to put in place. Um, you know, Don mentioned early on that uh, some of it feels like a blur. Those early sessions where I was sitting in my own kitchen with my head down after a fight with IT about Zoom and whether or not Zoom was the best tool and the most accessible one, um, they do feel like a blur to me now. I try not to hold it against IT in meetings. Um, but the reality is, you know, we we did a very, now I can say four years later, it was a very easy thing to do, to make our rooms connected, to train our staff quickly, and to just put some licenses out there. Um, we had the funding at the time. We needed to use it. We made it happen. Um, it gets more interesting, though, uh, because this is just the start of things, um, and also a little bit trickier moving forward. So um, before I get to that moving forward, though, I should also mention that in these four years since um, COVID really changed the way that we do things, we also have established quite a few other pieces that aren't just telehealth, but that establish the health of our communities. Um, we have mobile pantries in 10 locations on and off throughout the year, depending on the weather. Um, those pantries are predominantly produce distributions. They're in connection with our local food bank. Um, we also offer after school meals um, and summer lunches during the summer, obviously, uh, but after school meals in a number of places where uh, the statistics tell us that kids leaving school may not get another meal. Um, so we feed them in our locations afterwards. We have two social workers on staff. Uh, that's happened within the last two years. Uh, we have resource closets in four locations right now, and those have everything from things like laundry detergent and, um, you know, personal hygiene issues uh, to diapers to, um, you know, just general connectivity to we've got lots of resources about connections there. And then uh, we have health and wellness programming for all ages. The other piece I want to get to here um, is that we're a trusted community resource. I think we hit on this already uh, in the intro and in some of the pieces, but uh, once I got out there um, within our own local digital equity community and with our digital equity coalition in Northeast Ohio has long had a community around digital equity, equity uh, but the pandemic really kind of crystallized those relationships and also made um, businesses and healthcare institutions and banks um, and those uh, community pillars that used to just think that someone else would take care of access and connectivity. Um, it brought this idea to the forefront and they were suddenly interest in, interested in being a part of a digital equity coalition. So early on um, in the pandemic, I started attending those meetings because I've been our representative uh, in those communities for a long time. And I started talking about the resources that you just saw, which really, again, they're pretty you know, basic stuff. We just connected some rooms. Um, but I drew some attention, and uh, one of the interesting things that happened locally, not only are we a world-class place for libraries, but we're also a world-class place for healthcare. And we have three large healthcare institutions, um, the Cleveland Clinic being one of them. They're probably the best known. But University Hospitals, uh, which is affiliated with Case Western Reserve University, and then our Metro Health System, um, are all locally within uh, the county and um, all do a lot of uh, really amazing work around research access, um, health equity issues. They started talking to each other. Um, and then they started talking to me because I had places in the community, I had the people, um, but I also had the locations that would provide additional access for customers who weren't connected. And they were starting to realize that this was something that they had to care about. Um, the other benefit that we have locally, though, and I, I touched on this a few minutes ago, we had a strong group. We've had a digital equity coalition in place for over 20 years, um, and we've worked together. We've aligned our basics curriculum for training um, around basic digital literacy and around access. It includes our libraries locally, but it also included a number of community technology centers. And um, the Cleveland Foundation has funded much of our work. We are incredibly grateful to them. Uh, and during the pandemic, the Cleveland Foundation reached out to uh, the cohort that they had funded recently 
um, to help us align curriculum and really make strong connections with each other. And they asked us if we would like to, uh, well, they asked us to formulate a plan for how we would host digital navigators in the community. And that is really um, what has changed a part of how we connect, both with the health systems here, um, but also with each other. We have digital navigators and community health workers spread out throughout our communities now, and they're doing that hands-on work with customers. So if someone has a, an appointment and they wanna use one of our rooms, but they don't know how to use their phone to set it up or get into my chart, which is what all of our community, what all of our health entities use locally, um, they connect with my navigators. We have four on staff. They're amazing and amazingly busy. We got an ARPA grant to fund uh, Purple Rain here, which is our digital navigator van, um, which you cannot miss when it's out. Um, but the other piece that happened somewhat uh, serendipitously, I, I connected with the Cleveland Clinic to talk about telehealth, and we were originally trying to get our, um, to find an easier pathway between their process and our rooms. Um, I can tell you, tell you two years on, we still have not found that, that easier pathway. Um, their process is complicated. Ours is not so complicated, but making them talk to each other and providing an easy way for our customers to schedule an appointment and immediately book a room with us just is still eluding us. Um, but one of my old colleagues uh, in the digital equity realm was also on that call. And during it, he took a conversation offline and said, hey, we need somebody to train on my chart, which again is our portal. Um, or the app that our uh, healthcare institutions use. We don't have people who write curriculum, but you do. And so for the last two years, in addition to those connectivity pieces, we've also been working on a baseline curriculum, uh, starting first with the Cleveland Clinic, but they're making the connections to all three of the other health organizations here. Um, and that baseline curriculum is around my chart. And um, it is in a rough draft form, um, I can say that the challenges and the complications come mostly on the health healthcare side, um, but we are almost at a point where we're ready to share it out uh, via Digital Learn, which is PLA's training site. Um, that's digitallearn.org. Cleveland has its own site. We are going to make it available to our colleagues locally and really anyone else who wants to take advantage of it um, as a baseline for anyone who wants to train on my chart or some similar um, health related app uh, so that they can start training too. And we see that as our next role in this area really is to provide, um, oops, sorry, went too fast there, provide the um, access to what we do best, which is be a trusted resource uh, and help our community understand how to utilize what they need to get access to their health needs. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to that moving forward. We'll be uh, piloting it with some students at Metro Health and some community health workers over the next few months. And then my trainers will hopefully start training in our branches um, and make it away available to the other digital navigators and trainers and community health technology centers in the area. Um, and then from that point, it's available to anyone else who would like access. Thank you. Very cool. Uh, Cuyahoga system for Becky is just remarkable in its innovation and uh, especially impressive is uh, the outreach uh, to partners. Uh, okay. That just makes so much sense than rather just trying to figure out what's needed on the provider side without talking to providers themselves. And also they you know, should have a ton of resources and they may have funding to support you. So you're leading the way on that as well. We've seen a lot of that on emergency response, partnering with EMAs and uh, libraries doing that. There are a number of questions for you, but uh, one will ask you here, maybe you can respond to the others in the chat, but related to sure. Zoom and the, uh, do you have any data on how people are using the Zoom? And then also a question uh, related to manage the license. Yeah, so um, 
It was, and actually I, I can say it feels like such a bad memory to me that um, <laughs> that whole Zoom conversation was tricky. Um, it, it is our IT department that manages those. All of the, I can tell you a couple of things. Um, we've kept them going for a few years. There has been no controversy, no um, terrible things happening with those licenses. I don't actually know at what um, level they're being utilized. Uh, it's been kind of quietly and just happened. Um, so I, I'm sorry I didn't bring data on that particular thing with me because I, I don't even really pay that much attention to it anymore. Um, but it has been a service that's out there with the community. I do know that they are being utilized because we just re-upped them with our board um, and paid for the licenses again. But um, none of the... It's one of those things that we just put out there and then kind of ducked our head. And since none of the uh, terrible scenarios where, you know, people were running their own bootleg porn out of our branches or whatever it was going to be. Um, this is the first time, too, that I've ever used the term bootleg porn in a library presentation. Um, but all <laughs> of those terrible things that we thought would happen didn't happen. Um, and so much like uh, connecting our telehealth rooms Sometimes we just throw stuff out there to see if it works. And this one has been working, but also kind of working quietly and the way it should in the background where people just utilize it as they need to. That's that's great. And like so many other situations, libraries, they don't create a set of regulations and rules for how to do things. They just deal with situations as human beings to human beings. And you just can't write all that up. And and this is one of the great things about libraries is the way they deal with problems, just one by one, person by person. If you'll stop sharing, Becky, we it. will we will turn it over to uh, Michelle and Karen. Welcome to you both uh, for being here. Tell us how things are going in New Jersey. I am going to try to share my screen here, and uh, just as I do that, Rebecca, to let you know that New Jersey does cover Zoom for a lot of libraries in our state too. So um, let's see. Okay, so I want to tell you about today our New Jersey Health Connect at your library telehealth program, which um, is funded by ARPA, of course, and uh, it was implemented by Just for the Health of It at the East Brunswick Public Library. And Karen's going to tell you all about that. Uh, but this was our first attempt at a program uh, to get libraries statewide involved in telehealth in, in, some, in some way. So I started noticing uh, throughout the pandemic um, and I was um, involved a lot with disaster response and recovery, but I started no noticing throughout the pandemic, um, the rise in telehealth. I mean, I used it myself. You probably used it yourself during the pandemic. And I started seeing, um, as I kind of kept up on things that were going on in the library world, that libraries were starting to get involved in this. And of course we know certain things about, um, telehealth. And we know that, you know, the pandemic put spotlight on inequities in the healthcare system, and especially the, among those that are in our most vulnerable communities. And, uh, and that telehealth services grew throughout the pandemic, but they have not gone away and they continue to grow. So telehealth is really here to stay. And there is a role, I believe, that libraries need to play in this in advancing health equity and we thought we tried to bridge that through NJ Health Connect at your library. Now, there are many benefits to having um, telehealth available through the libraries. Of course, you know, it's convenient, it's portable, it's affordable, um, and it, it ensures that there's healthcare services that meet the needs of diverse populations. And we are able to, through it, address barriers and access to care that's common among people who lack technology, who lack the devices, who lack broadband um, or, uh, and are unable to see a provider or a doctor nor during normal business hours when others are usually when they're working. So we know how convenient it can be and we wanted to come up with some kind of a program that might um, help 
people address and overcome these barriers. So I remember that um, we had um, a lot of the ARPA funding and um, in discussing pro projects and programs with our state librarian, Jen Nelson, we had some funding available and we're discussing what might be um, a good use for some of that, that ARPA funding. And I know that I was really intrigued with this telehealth and I saw it popping up everywhere. And I you know, thought this might be a really good, a good pilot project for us to try statewide. So uh, we discussed that, Jen and I, and uh, we were very lucky that um, she said, yeah, go ahead, let's run with it. Let's see what we can come up with. And so I, I started doing research on what kind of models would, what it would look like throughout the state of New Jersey because we have something like 450 libraries throughout the state of New Jersey. You know, every state library is different. Every library system in every, every state is different. And in New Jersey, it looks like a small state, but we are one of the most diverse states, if not the most diverse state in the country. Um, and we also have all these sort of independent standalone municipal libraries. We do have county library systems, but if you look at each of the branches within those county library systems, they are all like, and they all are like standalone libraries, even though they're within a county system, they each have individual communities that they're serving. So I wanted to come up with a model that would sort of overall work for all of these libraries in New Jersey, no matter what kind of library that they were, and no matter how small I wanted it to be scalable. And then I also thought about the burden that COVID had put on our librarians and how exhausted we all were and um, and so I didn't want to overburden the librarians with um, with taking care of equipment and all the things that come along with it. So the first person I called was Annie Norman of Delaware because uh, I think Aunt Delaware and Annie they she was and and Don you probably had her on before I'm sure but I think that uh, Annie uh, was the first to do some sort of telehealth um, in the state, uh, throughout the state of Delaware. So I wanted to learn all about her model. She was very generous in sharing with me. And then I called a, no, uh, a number of other states that were, and another a number of libraries in other states that were offering telehealth. And I found a, a variety of models available and you're probably familiar with them. I show a few of them here. And uh, one of them is that telehealth booth, that kind of that either it's in the library, it's out in the community and you go inside this booth and it has all the monitoring equipment and you are able to log in and, and do a telehealth visit with your with your doctor. And then you had take all your vitals. And then when you come out, it's sort of self cleans and all of that kind of stuff. And um, I know that Delaware had some of them and they're super expensive, you know, and I didn't I didn't know if that was an appropriate model for 450 libraries in uh, New Jersey. I know Delaware has a much smaller system, so I think that that worked well for them. The other things I saw were where people set up uh, different rooms. You know, of course, you need a private room to do telehealth. And so they had uh, separate rooms set up and they would have all the equipment so that you could connect via Zoom with your doctor and do the telehealth visit. But then they also offered monitoring kits that you see in the lower left. And these would be blood pressure cuffs, pulse ox, things to take your heart rate and all that kind of stuff. And I was a little bit, you know, leery of that. This is my own personal bias against this. You know, again, every state is different. And I know a lot of libraries do that. And that's in totally up, up to you. But this, these are, this was my thought on this. And I talked to some people, um, some nurses about this. First of all, I didn't want librarians responsible for cleaning that equipment and upkeeping that equipment. Um, and I know that blood pressure, particularly the blood pressure cuffs, can be very, very unreliable. Take it for somebody who has high blood pressure. Um, these blood pressure cups need to be used in conjunction with a healthcare specialist and they need to be recalibrated every time you use them. And I simply could not see our librarians in these small libraries being responsible for that kind of an upkeep. So for me, that was kind of like, you know, it wasn't thrilled with that either. You know, so, so what to do? You know, just like a good librarian, I don't know the answers to everything, but I know, I know who to call. And so after I did my basic research, I called the one person in the state that I worked with before, and that's Karen Perry, who I think is, um, who I think is probably the foremost expert on health literacy uh, in the state of New Jersey, who won 
a Library Journal Mover and Shaker Award for her uh, work on Just for the Health of It in East Brunswick. And I said, Karen, you know, I, 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 I have this funding to do a telehealth program statewide. I want it to be very easy for librarians. So uh, librarians are more like the connectors and they don't have to do much work for it. What are your ideas? And, uh, and Karen, I know, had a lot of them. So at this point, I want to turn it over to Karen because she was really the one uh, who was who, who put together the, the bones and the program of um, NJ Health Connect at your library and East Brunswick really kind of took it from there. So Karen, I want to turn that over to you to explain how the whole program worked. And in the end, I'll come back and I'll tell you how we were planning, Karen and I, to move forward with the with the program. So Karen. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, so interesting to hear all the things that are going on um, in Ohio, and I, I'm really so impressed. And I'm, I'm on the same page with you when I say that I agree that there's um, such a need for libraries to fill this gap, and there really is no greater injustice than the right to be healthy. Um, some sobering facts, which Don kind of talked about at the beginning, um, which kind of frame what I'm going to talk about, is why telehealth is so important because it is so affordable, accessible, and a way to really um, bridge the gap towards health equity and reduce systemic racism, which is a big concern now of the hospitals. So um, there is, um, um, right now the, U the United States has probably the lowest um, life expectancy among high income countries we also have the highest amount of avoidable deaths. So it's another indication of why we need um, access to telehealth. And Americans also see doctors less often than people in other countries. We have the lowest amount of practicing physicians and hospital beds per 1,000 population. So um, this is my segue into NJ Health Connect. NJ Health Connect is a simple program. When Michelle came to me, I knew that it would be something very novel to try to expand out to libraries, and I wasn't sure the reaction that we would get. So I wanted something that was structured in a very simple way with very simple goals. And we were very pleased that the program really took public libraries in a new direction of public health. We showed librarians, which was our goal. It was a very educational endeavor that there is an intersection between public libraries and public health in building healthy communities upstream in the community as opposed to downstream, uh, which is the hospital, the ER, um, the, emer the emergency room, the hospital, the doctor's office. Upstream is where I always feel that health really begins. It's where the education and the interventions can take place. And we also wanted to engage public libraries in public health by educating them about health literacy resources throughout New Jersey using telehealth as the main platform. So um, NJ Health Connect really began when Michelle approached me because I run the Just for the Health of It program out of the East Brunswick Library. Our work has been focused on health literacy, helping people find the information that they could use, understand, make it accessible. It's really been on the side of reading, literacy, not on the digital side. That's why I'm so interested in hearing all these other things that other libraries are doing. So when Michelle came to me and she said she wanted to do this program, immediately what came to mind was access to care. Now, access to care is a um, identified barrier to health equity. It is uh, has been identified in um, our, we have a uh, healthier Middlesex group in, in central Jersey. It is made up of four library of um, four major hospital systems. And every three years, they're required by the Affordable Care Act to do what's called a CHIP, C-H-I-P. It's a Community Health Improvement Plan that identifies overarching health priorities in Middlesex County. And among things like nutrition, obesity, mental health, one of the things that came out after doing hundreds of focus groups, online surveys and interviews is that there is a need for access to care. Now, they define access to care as uh, ensuring that all community members have awareness of and equitable access to affordable, comprehensive and culturally appropriate health information, 
education, and quality care. So NJ Health Connect, in a nutshell, is a combination of health literacy with technology to address the barriers of access to care. Karen. Uh, Michelle, could you just go back to that other slide? I wanted to just uh, talk about the um, the I, iPads. So, Karen, yeah. you tell me when to advance the slides because I'm not okay. sure to go to the next one. Okay, so just stay right there. Okay, so very um, briefly, who did we want to reach when we re when we rolled out NJ Health Connect? We were looking to reach socioeconomically vulnerable vulnerable people vulnerable people at risk for poor health outcomes in some of New Jersey's most distressed communities that were identified by the Municipal Revitalization Index that measures each municipality's distress level on things like social, economic, physical, and fiscal conditions. We were looking at people who were at risk for poor health outcomes because of the social determinants of health, where they're born, live, learn, work, play, and worship. Specifically, we were looking to target low-income and poor individuals, seniors, immigrants, and people with disabilities. And interestingly, they're the same people who use libraries every day. We see them all the time in the libraries. They don't have a computer at home. They, um, they need, may need to do a telehealth appointment, meet with a doctor online. English may not be their second language. They have minimal technology skills. So people, especially um, people like immigrants, who work shifts and cannot see a doctor. So during normal working out, during normal visiting hours. So we were looking at designing a very simple interface. And the reason is um, because we felt that it would be a lot easier for the librarians and for the end users if it was, and my focus was to make it really clean. So again, circling back to access to care, we wanted to make sure that the end goal of NJ Health Connect was would be to address access to care because people that don't have access to care, um, they get diagnosed at a later stage of disease. They have longer and more frequent hospitalizations, use the ER room for things that they should not use that are preventable, have poor quality of life, live with unmanaged, uh, unmanaged chronic diseases, don't have health, health insurance, don't do preventive checkups, and cost the healthcare system billions of dollars in withheld Medicare penalties for recidivism in the hospital within 30 days. So again, I'm going back to my work with Healthier Middlesex because there is such a concern, again, on keeping people healthy to keep them out of the hospital. So this is what uh, the NJ Health Connect interface looked like. It was made up of um, nine folders, as you can see. It's a simple program. It was run out of the East Brunswick Public Library using our consumer health team and our IT staff. We disseminated 450 iPads to 151 libraries, and it was a completely voluntary program. So the libraries had to sign up and sign a, a memorandum of understanding. Michelle, could you just go back to that slide with the, um, we also um, had preloaded the iPads with these nine folders done by the library's IT staff. And the iPads were locked down for the duration of the program, which was about nine months by the time we got the grant off the ground. Uh, looking at this from a health literacy perspective, you will see nine folders. We had of the first folder, see a doctor. We had apps to the major hospital systems in all corners of New Jersey. Um, so, so that was what the, the primary thing that we were focusing on, but we wanted to get, again, combine it with health literacy. So we had an app for get health information. We use medlineplus.gov, which is basically around eighth grade reading level for health information. And it also provides access to health information in different languages. We had an app for getting health insurance in New Jersey for our Get Covered NJ, which is um, New Jersey's one-stop shop for health insurance. And of course, NJ Family Care, which is our Medicaid. We had updates, we had hotlines, uh, crisis hotlines for these, the uh, New Jersey State New Jersey Department of Health and Human Services. We had mental health information, teen health, teen health um, help, where we had apps for positive youth. 
uh, which is for drugs, alcohol, suicide, and self-harm, and the Trevor Project for LGBTQ. And then we had a folded for have a meeting where we had Zoom, uh, Google Meet, WebEx, and a few other um, services that libraries had asked us to um, add to the iPads. But then again, just I want to stress the iPads were locked down for the duration of the program. Michelle, you could just advance, please. And here's a picture of some of the libraries that were participating, all holding up, up their iPads. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, libraries were selected on a first come, first serve basis. Uh, I don't think we really turned anyone away. Um, again, we were trying to reach those in the most underserved communities, but I have to say we did have some affluent communities sign up and they actually were um, had very good uh, usage statistics. And there's a picture of John in the bottom left as he's unpacking um, hundreds of boxes that came in with iPads and Janelle uh, was hired as a temporary assistant for the duration of the grant. And she had to literally unpack each iPad, put them in cases and then repack them again for shipping or delivery. And there's one of the librarians that I met on one of our outreach visits. Next slide, please. So it was a um, monumental task to um, not just order, but to process and deliver all of these iPads. We went throughout the state, John and I, and we either delivered them in person or we shipped them and we did training um, online. I think we trained almost all the libraries, not all of them, but uh, close to all of them. And we had a lot of, of fun of fun, um, meeting all the libraries and getting to see people in all different parts of the state. Um, each of the iPads, like I said, they were populated with links and apps by our IT department. They had to be SIPA compliant because it was a federal grant and they utilized Meraki software, um, software which provided the remote management capability for our IT department to be able to remotely add or delete apps, but the libraries were not able to do that on their own. We went around, we trained the libraries. I wanted it to really be an exercise in health literacy, as well as getting libraries familiar with telehealth. I was, you know, this was new to really all of us, except the health literacy part to me. So that was really our goal. And I think we really were able to get libraries very excited about the tech, the resources throughout New Jersey and the ways that they can engage their communities in health. We also had um, marketing, we did, we had uh, marketing templates that were made out and sent to the libraries because I knew that once we put this in the hands of the libraries, that they were going to say, we don't have time to do our own marketing flyers and social media messaging. So um, we took care in East Brunswick Library of doing all of the writing of the marketing and just sending it out to all 151 libraries. And then each week I did something called marketing tidbits where we, I would take a, a specific resource in one of the folders and I would highlight it. And, and the libraries would use this to, um, to advertise to their own communities. Next slide, please. So uh, the, live, the iPads, um, some of the people asked about the lending policy because every library has their own lending policy. We left it very open. They would loan these out according to their own policy. We did require the libraries to sign a memorandum of understanding that said that they would provide a dedicated space to conduct an appointment. Um, some of the libraries chose to, to loan them out. Some of them said they were only for in-library use. Um, the iPads were locked down, but they also had to agree that they could only be used for the purpose of the program. The, they had to agree to sanitize each device when it was returned. They had to use our standardized social media materials. And we did ask them to track the number of times that each device was loaned out each month. And again, it's HIPAA, so you can't really ask somebody what they're dealing with it. But I would tell the librarians, a lot of times people love to talk about their health and they'll say, oh yeah, you know, I'm, my doctor says I, you know, I need to monitor my diabetes more. And they, they 
they make the librarians make it a sense of what the iPads are being used for. So we were able to actually collect some very interesting stories. And that's what I told the librarians, collect the statistics, but also if you can, try and glean some interesting stories. Um, some real life examples of how the iPads were used and they did go out many hundreds of times throughout all 151 libraries is they were used for telehealth appointments, a lot of them were used for job searching. Jobs, um, employment, of course, is considered a social determinant of health by the World Health Organization. So we were happy about that. Um, some people use them for court. That was okay. Um, a lot of people use them for medications, meeting with the doctor. And also, um, some people just wanted to learn how to use an iPad. The librarians um, were very creative in what they did. I was very happy to see that Librarians really found ways to push the information out. They, they pushed the information out through newsletters. They set up tables in lobbies. They went out to community fairs, health fairs, senior centers, um, where they taught um, um, seniors how to use iPads and how to have lit, um, literacy skills. Um, um, so that was, I'm just looking here in my notes, some of the um, uses of the iPads. And then we phased out the program at the end of the grant. Um, we were hoping that the librarians would transition the program to their own customized interface. So we really were hoping that the librarians would, would not just disable the program completely once the devices were, were um, disabled by our IT department, but I worked with them to come up with some kind of, and I actually had instructions on ways they could configure the iPad interface so that they would have links to their own hospital, um, links to their own hospital telehealth services, and also to their own local health resources and to free statewide resources. So that was our goal to keep libraries that were interested. And there were certain trends of libraries that had um, more usage than other libraries. But overall, you know, we were happy that it was what I call a first big step, the first foray of public libraries really into telehealth for many libraries into health literacy in general. So I feel like it was a first big step to position us alongside hospital doctors and the healthcare community um, in really improving community health. Okay. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, we are coming up on our hour. Uh, can gonna... I, just, uh, I just want to finish up that we do want to move forward with this. Karen and I are planning on working this spring with the Mental Health Association of New Jersey. We're focusing now on mental health. And these are just a couple of uh, uh, trainings we're going to do. A few more apps that we want to add and trainings out to the libraries. There's a QPR, which is question, uh, persuade, and refer. It's a suicide prevention training. Uh, RAP is a wellness uh, reaction uh, action plan. And uh, we have 988, which is a national mental health crisis and access hotline. And then we have our own New Jersey United by Wellness for, um, Virtual Wellness Center, which is going to put uh, people directly in contact with more than 80 um with 80 groups that meet uh, weekly over, you know, uh, that meet weekly uh, on a number of topics, whether it be substance abuse or any kind of other abuse or suicide prevention, people can borrow the iPad and they can t attend a meeting. So this is uh, uh, what the focus is gonna be going forward and we're hoping to keep it simple, um, have the librarians that are still interested in participating in the program, um, upload these apps, get the training from the Mental Health Association of New Jersey. And then here's just some of our advertising that you could see around the state. We had uh, we had bill billboards on uh, the, the, um, the highways, we had bus banners uh, that we saw all over the place and people would just, uh, some of our um, librarians would just snap these pictures as we, as they went by and they would catch a glimpse of the buses uh, or, the, um, or the turnpike sign. So, um, so, so thank you for, for everything. Thank, thanks for listening and happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Karen. That, that actually was my question is how do you, how do you see this going forward? So you pre-answered me. 
Uh, I just want to make the observation that that this is a great example of the collaboration between the state agencies and the individual library systems. And and you mentioned, of course, uh, Annie Norman in Delaware. They have you know their all their libraries are connected to the state network, and they're you know they've been a leader in this, as is Texas and a number of others. So we love this relationship because there's so much to deal with and be able to concentrate resources and share them across a, a state that has a whole raft of state specific regulations and needs is just such a smart thing to do. I also want to just kind of add that, you know, uh, the, the value contribution here, <clears throat> we talked about these partnerships with uh, health providers and I just did a little quick napkin arithmetic and that is commonly understood that the, the health system represents 17% of the U.S. total economy, a massive number. Uh, that translates into $4 trillion a year for health. And, you know, when you look at the outcomes, we're just not that great. You can compare us to a lot of European and Asian countries for that matter. Uh, and so what would might be the contribution to that service that library is providing? So I calculated one, one tenth of 1%. Check it out. And that's, that's $4 billion that, that libraries could be contributing to the, to that uh, entire system. Even if that were one hundredth of 1%, that would be $400 million worth of, worth of uh, services that library is providing part of the system without recognition. It would be great if we had some kind of numbers to be able to make that global case and divert some of those funds that are just chewed up in all these uh, overly priced, under-provided services and, and pharmaceuticals to, to libraries that are playing an ever larger role in the delivery of health and information in the country. So we're a little over the hour. This is not a TV show, so it's not a hard close, but we'd like to like to finish it. And so I'd like to go back to Becky and ask her that question that I was going to ask Michelle and Karen about the future. So what do you see as the next stage for uh, telehealth in Cuyahoga, Becky? You know, I, Don, I would love to um, make this a little bit more, what do I want to say, formal. Uh, clearly, we did something pretty informal and threw it out there. I'd still love to get our connections going with the, the health entities um, and make that more formal so that you could book a space in our rooms when you book your appointment. Um, I think I, I noted in the, the chat to a uh, um, to a question about making connections. The most of our health entities, though, have seen um, that at the top now what they hear, well, it was community health that was tasked with talking um, with making these connections in the community, what they hear now from their CEOs is, well, isn't everybody connected now? Didn't we take care of that? And so um, there still are real challenges and, and really our challenges have become more internal workings with our with our health organizations. That's where our holdup is. Um, I think though, you know, we continue to work and see what the needs are. Maybe those needs are addressed more through our social worker moving forward, but definitely some of the concerns our staff had early on um, never were not founded. And so I, I think we can continue to just make stronger ties um, with the partners that we have. Excellent. Excellent. So um, we have a, a hand raised, surprisingly, well, actually not so surprisingly, from Stephen Abram, our uh, able <laughs> commentator and critique. Uh, from north of the border, uh, Stephen. Welcome back. What what have you got? We're we're running over, so please try to make it quick. <laughs> so uh, I love the presentations. You're doing amazing work, and you should be proud of yourselves. I would uh, I'd ask how this. I, I want to know how you're preparing the staff. So there's target audiences. I'm doing a lot of work in dementia and aphasia right now as a mental health concern. We also know that uh, there's target audiences that are different. Like the number one thing that cause, causes uh, non-high school completion or non-university college completion is mental health. And so when we look at those target audiences, 
how do you prepare staff or help them understand the differences between uh, working with an emergency versus working with uh, chronic disease? I think library sweet spot is chronic disease and chronic me mental health concerns, which puts us out of the emergency stuff, like call 911 or go to the emergency room. But uh, how do we train people to be effective at this kind of stuff we, and and to understand the confidentiality issues that it's the animus is on the requester, not the librarian to decide confidentiality. If they if they divulge, then that's their uh, adult um, right. So I don't know whoever wants to take a jump in on that. I'd love to know how you're preparing the librarians and helping them build their skills on telehealth. Stephen, if you want me to, to, to speak up here, we have a consumer health team at East Brunswick, which we've had for about 10 years. All of the librarians are trained to be on the team. They cannot just be any master's level librarian. They need to get certification through the Medi Medical Library Association. And all of my librarians are level two certified through the MLA. That's very important. Health information is very tricky because it comes under HIPAA. And I, because I work closely with the hospitals, they are, uh, we have a custom health research service at East Brunswick. That's what, um, like, again, our, our focus is on health literacy. And librarians have to be very careful that um, we, when they take information in person, we go off desk. We don't do things in a, po in, in, we don't interview people, do a reference interview on the desk. And then when we conduct the actual research, we do the, re the research off desk. And then the hospital wants us to immediately shred the information. Um, as far as determining when it's an emergency or not, librarians do take um, mental health emergency training. Periodically, it's been offered by the state library. It's been offered by the hospitals. It is a very important topic right now um, because we have had people come here um, like right before the library closes and they have no place to sleep or they're in the middle of a, a mental health crisis. The most important thing for librarians on the desk to know is their community. Um, that is number one. They need to know who they can call. We have a health portal where we aggregate our local um, health healthcare resources, especially for mental health providers, but they need to know all of their services. I would say to start number one, is you need to know your community services to help people when you need to tap into them. I don't know if anyone has anything else to add. That's an excellent answer, thank you. I'll add to, um, even though this wasn't an area that I talked about, Stephen, but um, all of our supervisors are in the process of going through crisis mental health training right now. Um, our local uh, Adams Board, which is mental health for the, the county, um, offers a four-day training. It's really intensive, um, but also really amazing from what I hear. And so um, all of our supervisors are in the process of going through it so that they feel more um, equipped and supported when someone comes in who's really in crisis. I'd, I'd, uh, I, that's a, good, a great answer too. I'd, I'd just add that one marker we're using in our single payer system is our most overused part of our healthcare system as emergency services because of doctor shortages. And so we're using, we're trying to track emergency room diversion because if we can show that the libraries through the consumer health activities divert people from the emergency room and into the social services that can deal with some of these problems on a more long, ongoing basis, it, uh, it ends up being something that the government listens to and and could possibly fund through the various granting agencies and i think that's yeah. an interesting marker to use yeah that's uh, that's to my point on the economics of all this Stephen. that there's a tremendous value that's being supplied and unrecognized as standard procedure but this is a big one i mean this is really big in terms of of uh cash money being spent or diverted. So uh, building that case, I think, is worthwhile. We're going to we're gonna try to distribute this chat. It's really been active today, and I don't know if everybody got their question answered. Uh, there was one related to your slides, I think, 
And I don't know if you have those posted anywhere. There's a link for them. But if you might, if you do have those somewhere that they're linked, please put that in the chat now, Rebecca, Michelle, and we'll distribute that. And I guess people can find you anyway through LinkedIn. We have your LinkedIn links on the on the registration page, and I suppose they can ask you directly. So with that, uh, I think we will uh, close out the session, the recording anyway, and thank our speakers, Becky and Michelle and Karen, brilliant work and so, so appreciated by so many people. I know thousands of people have benefited from the work Tens of thousands of people have been from the work you're doing and uh, more to come. So we'll revisit this uh, as the technology continues, which another part of the equity equation is that technology is advancing very quickly on all fronts and it's expensive. Medical technology is expensive, you know, MRI, I don't know, machine costs a million dollars or something like that. So, so this is, this is a classic scenario that creates inequities because the cost of the services depend on these advanced technologies are only affordable by people that have enough money and that just expands the the general divides between people that can afford it people being served by these before they become you know more uh publicized and and affordable and spread out uh but that's the the rate of technological advance is making that time longer between early adopters and available to most people. Uh, it's a challenge because we we really have to pay more attention to our equity issues. We're not. We're trying to here, and I think we've done something of that today again. And thank you so much. Uh, we'll have the recording up, and uh, hopefully uh, by tomorrow you can look at this again on the weekends. We. We have about as many people watch the video afterward as register in the first place. So that's that's gratifying to some extent. But with that, I will thank you again and sign off formally for the session till next time. Thanks, Don. Thanks for having me.